Yep. Kind of had enough of that article. It's a good thing I got tools around to take care of the problems in my life with my tools. <laughs> I'm sorry, folks. We're, we're trying to introduce you to a paper. Um, an implicit technology of generalization. It's a good one, um, as most of them are when we put them on our channel, um, because we're not going to put bad ones. That's an idea. Maybe we should put bad ones on the channel, too. <laughs> Maybe we have, and you just haven't figured it out yet. Anyway, um, implicit technology of generalization. And if you're wondering why I look like I belong in space at the moment, or on a baseball field with weird glasses, it's because I'm trying to teach you a point about this article, which is that supposedly you can train for generalization. And it's possible, if we combine a bunch of articles together, that you realize that you might be able to train for overgeneralization, which might simply be the case here. So, you get the idea. All right, because I don't think there's going to be anything too scary about using tin snips on paper and having stuff jump back into my eyes and or potentially somebody throwing stuff at me and hitting me in the helmet. Ugh, which, uh, that, stop. <laughs> this, I, people. <laughs> anyway, that's, my kiddo had a smaller head back back when he was playing baseball. Ugh, a smaller head than me. Because <laughs> we all know I have a big head. All right, all right sorry. Stokes and Fair, 1977. Oh, oops. We can do this article really quick, or we can do it really slow. So we're going to try to find a combination, even though I've got two pages of here. Are you ready? So the basic idea was that Stokes and Bear did a review of basically generalization training uh, in articles that there was a hundred and some odd articles that they reviewed, quite a few articles um, that had been published in behavioral literature um, in 1977. So still early in the official field, right? But uh, uh, still a lot of a lot of stuff being published, and there was obviously behavioral articles published before 68. But anyway, side note. So generalization at that time, uh, up until this article, essentially, uh, mainstream thinking of generalization was essentially a side effect, right? Um, a positive one in a lot of cases, but it was essentially a side effect. It was a passive process. It wasn't active. You didn't program for it. Right? Now, of course, everybody's right. Cooper, they're like, why are we having this discussion? To give you some historical context, that's why we're having this discussion, is because why is it that we do that now. Well, here's why. It was this article, right? So um, Stokes and Bear, they reviewed the, the journal articles out there and I said, hey, you know what? We're gonna look at all the ways people have addressed generalization. And I think the important part, point that, again, I've already said was that it's up until about now, um, this was a, not now is in 77. So um, it, was a, it was considered passive. So you do your discrimination training, discrimination training, discrimination, and, so, and you ended up getting generalization. So people would think that that's just what happens when you do discrimination training. So Sure, in a sense, but the, what, the, but they thought a different approach. They thought, well, what happens if you can, can't you just program for it? Isn't it a response kind of into itself? And we'll get into that in a few minutes. All right. So there were nine general categories of different ways in which they identified. There wasn't they didn't exist a priori. They did it after the fact, right? So uh, post hoc, they said, well, these are the nine different categories of generalization procedures that we have found. So we're going to zip through those really quick. Uh, train and hope, also known as spray and pray. Um, so let's see across experiments. Um, so again, they're looking across a whole bunch of experiments, uh, experimenters um, that they would do this generalization training uh, across time, they do training, um, basically a huge number of these articles that did this train and hope approach um, showed successful generalization, like 90%, but it was almost accidental and the focus was still like on this weird O level response, like the organism did it, like it was just not something you could build into your program, so they just did it. Anyway, so sequential conference, uh, se sequential, I hate it when I write stuff so quickly or so early in the morning, I have no idea what it is that I said. Sequential mod. I'm just going to read the printed ones easier. Sequential modification. Um, consistently coming up with different scenarios, um, different stimuli, and so on and so forth, being nice and sequential about it, and then kind of forcing um, the organism to experience all these different versions of things and blah, blah, blah. Um, it works for generalization as well. However, it gets you hyper-rigidity. So we'll move on. Introduced to natural maintaining contingencies. I have a note here on this one. Introduced, this is behavior traps. It was really funny. I was like, I was reading this, and I'm like, behavior traps! And then literally I turned to the next, like the next three lines and said, like a behavior trap. <laughs> Oh, I've read this article too many times. I knew it was coming and I didn't even know it. Um, so anyway, so behavior traps, et cetera, not technically generalization, um, but really it's more about transfer stimulus control. So 
as we come down this list, you're going to start to see or hear or whatever that we are going to be more about programming for generalization. Um, so the next step, introduce natural, oh, I just did that one, train sufficient exemplars, right? So this one's interesting. If you train too many, you have sequential, I still can't read it, modification. So if you train too many, you have sequential modification, but if you don't train enough, you don't have enough exemplars. So you're going to find that happy medium. Well, where is it? No, nobody knows. In fact, it's an area that's still probably ripe for research. Um, because, and it's probably different for everybody based on your learning history, which we'll find out when we get into this article and in other articles about generalized imitation. So because all of it's different all the time, and that's just the way science is. All right. Um, so train six sufficient exemplars. Um, so you don't have to train all examples of a scenario. So if you're trying to teach me about cats or fuzzies or whatever those things are, that's, what is that? What, the stuffy. That, what, do you, what do you call them, Brad? Stuffed animal. Stuffed animal. Yeah, all right. So we could probably come up with a bunch of different names for them or a bunch of different examples. Like you go to my daughter's room, she's got like more of them than I care to admit um, because that means I bought them. Um, anyway, so we could show all of them. Or you could show a handful of them, and if you show a handful, and you could present one as, is, what is this? Describe there, you know, what label this or tack this or whatever you want to say, um, and blah blah blah. And so it's like the stuffy, like congratulations. But if you do too many, it's, they're, it's going to be too rigid, and you get a stuffy that they haven't seen. They're like, I don't know what that is because it's not a stuffy in my, you know, concept formation. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. all right, train sufficient examples. You all know this stuff. Train loosely. These are the guys that came up with all this stuff. It's right here. It's like there's a whole section on training loosely. And um, they reviewed all the articles associated with training loosely up until that point. I passed it. Um, let's see. Don't be overly strict. Brad, you do a lot of training loosely. You talk about it all the time, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's an example. All right. I said the irony, though, um, to show training loosely, we must not be loose. <laughs> so uh, the uh, my point is, is that in the experiments, in the journal articles, they're like, we must train loosely. But in order to demonstrate the training loosely in the journal article, you can't train loosely. It has to be a very rigid condition of training loosely. So there's a certain level of irony here um, when you start to look too deep at some of this stuff. Train because... enough, it feels good. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm really distracted. All right, let's see what else. Um, indiscriminable contingencies. This one's awesome because they referred back to, like, everybody. Um, and what does it mean? In, in indiscriminable con discriminable contingency. It literally means that you can't tell what contingency you're on. You can actually train that. It's really kind of cool. So think about resistance to extinction, right? So if I get you hyper-resistant to extinction, you're just going to be like, just engaging in behavior period, F the extinction, don't care. Reinforcers, ha, who cares? They're irrelevant because I'm so resistant to extinction. You don't even know what contingencies you're operating under, right? Essentially, this is about removing all the setting events so the organism can't tell what contingencies they're operating on. Um, there's a lot of delayed reinforcement involved in here. Um, in fact, it's a really good way to um, get generalization is to de delay the reinforcers, um, which is a horrific way to shape behavior, but a great way to get generalization. So these things start to get contradictory with each other. It really depends on what you're trying to do. Um, so, and as my notes here, I said, in an odd sense, it's a type of training loosely, which sounds really weird to think about. Um, but really what you're saying is that I've got this rigid contingency and then I'm going to start to change these. Con I'm going to start to make it less rigid. I'm going to put it on a, um, it's not going to be a fixed. It's going to be a, um, a variable schedule, right? And then you're going to just start to thin it out and go crazy. And then you may delay the reinforcers. So the organism gets into a scenario or person gets into a scenario and they just like, I, I don't know what to do. I'm just going to do something that's worked in the past. Whoa, generalization. And they don't even know what reinforcement contingency they're on. Program common stimuli. This is really good. My kiddo plays hockey. Um, so when I was reading this, I was like, <laughs> hockey stop sign. I even, I was so important, I wrote it down clearly. Um, so a hockey stop sign. Now, I don't know if you've seen these, but everybody knows what a stop sign is, right? So um, you got a stop sign. And up in Canada, the kids had, I don't know if they do it down in the States now, but up in Canada, all the kids um, at their age, they can't hit, you can't check in the back, right? So you check in the back, you can hurt somebody really bad. That's just, it's a no-no. So what did they do? They all stitch a stop sign literally right there. So instead of just sitting in practice telling the kids, don't hit people in the back, don't hit people in the back, what do they do? <laughs> they literally put a common stimuli in the environment that you want them to stop the behavior in, right? So boom, you get up there, you, you're skating, you're up, oh, a stop sign. <laughs> kids know what to do it, it, it works like it's really cool um so make training in the real world similar to um, um similar to the training environment um by using specific stimuli so you can train that in your training environment by bringing in the stimuli that will exist in the real world Ugh, anyway. this is all stuff like this is all repeat i just kind of a summary of the article i think it's a great article uh mediate generalization develop a skill that is useful in more than one scenario um for example if you want to cut things you know learning how to use 
these. In fact, I, I didn't learn how to use these, but somebody's like, here's 10 snips. Why didn't you use 10? I'm going to teach you how to squeeze a 10. No, I learned to use 10 snips by learning how to use scissors, which I probably don't even have any. The irony. All right. Anyway, um, so no, no scissors. So um, that was a scissor response, but just generalized. But, so it's a skill that's useful in more than one scenario. All right. So then train to generalize. Here's the important one, the one that I love the most. I'm going to speak about it very little because I think we're getting to the end of this video. So most important thing is that maybe generalization is a response in and to itself. Can you train it? Can you train an organism, quote unquote, to generalize? Can you train a person? Can you train me? I don't know. Maybe you can't. Maybe that's how all of this stuff came about. Maybe I was trained to generalize a little too much. So anyway, the point being that can you reinforce the behavior of generalizing neural responses? Another term for this might be creativity, but we'll leave that at another date or for another another article and talking about Karen Pryor's work. So, um, so yeah, train to generalize, and uh, that may be an interesting thing. And I'm going to wink, wink, nod, nod at generalized imitation here um, because that's an article that we'll probably cover someday. So there you go, um, Stokes. There, seventy-seven.